uh, Microsoft's uh, Entra Azure Active Directory. <clears throat> So I I have the uh, I have the first two first two sessions uh, back to back. So uh, there'll only be a, a brief pause uh, in between. I've, I've kind of combined the uh, uh, combined the decks and, and the demos. So uh, we'll be kicking off uh, the first half here. We'll be we'll be talking about the uh, the different authentication methods, uh, SSO and, and hybrid uh, identity. And then for the second part of my uh, session, we'll be talking about uh, the uh, identity secure score or secure score for identity. Kind of depends on where you, uh, what part of the documentation you look at, uh, and conditional access and identity protection. All right, so just kind of a, a brief, uh, uh, you know, spiel here on on uh, Azure AD overall. Um, Identity, of course, is our, our, our control plane now. You probably heard this time and time again. Uh, and being able to connect and use that single identity uh, across, you know, not only just our, our, our Microsoft uh, uh, properties, but also uh, our, our third party, you know, other clouds, uh, whether whether it's AWS or GCP or other SaaS providers, uh, you know, your your Salesforce, your uh, uh, ServiceNow, et cetera, SAP. Uh, being able to have that single identity makes it a lot easier for your users, makes it a lot easier for, for, for you um, to manage those identities, uh, you know, the, the entire identity lifecycle. Uh, and we'll be talking more about, uh, about that later today. <clears throat> but being able to do that and, and address that as, as a single entity uh, is, is going to increase security, uh, make it easier on, your, on you and your users. Uh, you, Azure Active Directory is the largest cloud identity uh, service in the world. Uh, you know, over, over 100,000 uh, enterprise customers, uh, you know, 30 billion uh, daily authentication requests uh, come through Azure AD. Uh, you know, we process more uh, authentication requests in an hour uh, than, the, than the next largest identity provider pr uh, uh, processes in an entire year. So we, we know a thing or two uh, about authentication and, and identity. So <clears throat> thinking about, you know, this unified identity management, being able to, to take your, your identities from your employees, your frontline workers, your customers, your partners, your vendors, uh, and, and manage them uh, in your environment, making sure that they're secure. So providing things like multi-factor authentication, uh, you know, uh, conditional access and, and compliance, not only for your employees, the ones that you control, but even for your customers uh, and, and, your, and your partners who may or may not employ uh, those same security methods in their own environment, you can still enforce those uh, security methods uh, for when they access your environment. <clears throat> so, Azure Active Directory can also synchronize uh, with your your on-prem uh, Windows, you know, Windows Server uh, Active Directory, of course. Uh, but one of the interesting things that that uh, not every that not everyone realizes is we can actually syn synchronize now with uh, uh, HR user data. Uh, so the, the, we have the the capability now to to uh, uh, completely manage the uh, user lifecycle uh, and and have the you know user provisioning process. Uh, born in uh, an HR system. So things like Workday and success factors, uh, you can now create your users, uh, have your HR department can create your create the users in, in your native HR system. Uh, and then, you know, based on, uh, you know, various parameters and requirements, date, start dates, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, can automatically provision uh, and enable <clears throat> that, uh, uh, that user uh, you know, on their start date, uh, and things like using things like verified ID, which I will talk about as in our final session today, uh, using leveraging things like verified ID to onboard uh, a, a brand new user, right, and verify that they are who they say they are. Uh, you know, without having to uh, uh, without having to come in. You know, we, we we still you know we're still looking at uh, you know a very large mobile. Uh, or remote uh, workforce. So being able to verify the identity of, uh, of your users, uh, you know, before, they, uh, before they're onboarded into your system <clears throat> and then managing that life cycle, right? So uh, a simple change uh, to a user's title uh, or department uh, 
in in the HR system uh, can be reflected uh, through uh, the the same type of provisioning process uh, and synchronization engine. Uh, throughout Azure AD, right? Uh, and we also make note of things such as reviews, right? So uh, you may be familiar with some of our security products such as insider risk management. So uh, if your HR system also processes employee evaluations, uh, you know, uh, terminations, notice, you know, notices, uh, et cetera, uh, that, that information can also be uh, brought in and used as uh, intelligence in the insider risk management. Uh, process. So, uh, and then also terminations, right? So, if uh, uh, you know if a user is is uh, uh, terminated, you can have you can pr put that in your uh, HR system, and you know if it doesn't matter if they're terminated the same day or they've put in their two weeks notice, uh, you can put in their termination date. Uh, or leave date uh, might be might be more politically correct, I suppose. Put in their leave date, and uh, on that date. You know, we can go through and you know delete you know delete or disable the user account. You know, remove them from all of the, all of the teams, uh, etc. And then, of course, you know, synchronizing out uh, you know with all the the uh, you know your external uh, apps uh, and, and having that single uh, without having to remember you know multiple passwords. And also, you know, if you do have uh, that that user. Uh, uh, Deletion, then the, their access to those third-party apps uh, then are also uh, uh, removed, right? So same thing for for anything, uh, you know, for your cloud-hosted or or even on-prem. So <clears throat> being able to to do this not only you know from from users from your know, your own users from your HR systems, uh, but even external identities, <laughs> whether it's another Azure AD. Uh, identity from uh, you know from a partner from from a, uh, a vendor uh, etc or even if they have you know uh, a, a gmail account or uh, you know or, or some other generic email right those identities can still be brought in uh, you know as guest users and you know given and even from that point given single sign-on you know if they if they need access to one of your SaaS apps or your other cloud hosted uh, apps or, or an on-prem uh, app through Azure AD proxy. So being able to, to provide that uh, uh, capability, you know, not only to your to your internal users, but, you know, your uh, maybe the, the, anything from, you know, temporary users or, or uh, uh, you know, vendors, uh, contractors, et cetera, uh, you know, it makes it a, a, a lot easier to uh, to provide access and, and control the, the, the life cycle overall. So you know, most of our customers uh, are, are, you know, are coming from a, uh, you know, an on-prem active directory. Uh, so, you know, being able to synchronize those identities up to Azure AD uh, and then <clears throat> essentially having your, your on-prem identity and your cloud identity synchronized, uh, you know, you only have to, you only have to deal with one identity to, to access, whether it's, uh, you know, on-prem apps or cloud apps, uh, et cetera. Right, so you know, upgrading this from from ADFS, you can you can greatly reduce you know your on-prem footprint, and in in many cases, uh, you know, uh, most of your users probably uh, can uh, can operate just with uh, just with their Azure uh, Azure AD uh, login, uh, and not not necessarily even you know uh, joined uh, to the local domain. Now there are of course uh, situations where uh, you have legacy on-prem apps that that require uh, the workstation itself to be joined to the domain, and uh, in that, those cases, you know, you'll have to do, uh, you know, hybrid identity uh, and have those uh, or a hybrid join uh, and have those devices joined and and uh, you know have those identities there. So, but it allows you to uh, you know, be able to go through and and see you know the different vulnerabilities that, that may be going on. Uh, you know, Defender for Identity uh, uh, can help uh, 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 identify threats not only in the cloud but but threats on prem uh, as well right so we can uh, part of defender identity is uh, the, the history is is uh, uh, you know it used to be advanced threat analytics and uh, defender ATP where an Azure uh, Azure ATP uh, where we're actually looking at the authentication traffic uh, on your domain controllers uh as well as uh and not as well as in the cloud looking for you know uh, uh um, you know some of your your uh, classic uh, on-prem attacks such as you know golden tickets and, and pass the hash uh etc 
So we can uh, we can identify those vulnerabilities and then uh, and then act upon those. So <clears throat> thinking about you know what are the different methods uh, of authentication uh, with Azure Active Directory? There are, there are there there are a number of of them. So you know when you when we think about uh, you know multi-factor authentication overall. We have the ability for, you know, our, our, our password, uh, passwordless technologies, uh, Authenticator, Windows Hello, FIDO2, uh, or Biometrics. Uh, and then, you know, we can push those out, either, you, you know, push notifications, you can use your soft, to soft tokens uh, or your hard tokens. Uh, you can even use, voice, you know, SMS or voice, although, you know, we pretty much discourage uh, that it, it's far less secure, right? Uh, you may see, uh, you'll see later, we'll talk about fish resistant uh, multi-factor authentication, and there's there's a, there's a difference uh, between you know just just multi-factor and phishing resistance multi-factor authentication. So, uh, and keep in mind, Windows Hello is is multi-factor. So you know you're you're providing you know your 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 username, the, the device, right? So let's think of your your laptop uh, as your laptop, desktop, et cetera, as, as your token, right? The TPM chip, that, that's your that's your token. And then your your biometric, whether it's your face or your fingerprint or your uh, uh, pin code, uh, you know, that is that is the multi-factor um, designation there. Uh, or you can use FIDO2, right? So you can have that physical security key that you can plug in, uh, either plug in or use NFC. Uh, uh, you know, there are a number of different uh, providers uh, for for the uh, uh, FIDO2 uh, tokens, uh, I think there's, I think I counted like 30 or so uh, different providers. So there's a lot of different uh, different ones and, and different methods uh, that can be you know employed in, in, in a number of different ways. So um, you know, thinking about you know the, the the big statistic there on the right, 99.9 percent .9 of identity attacks uh, can be prevented with multi-factor authentication. Now. Uh, 99.9 percent .9 that that's pretty good but when there are you know millions and millions of attacks every single day uh that 0.1 percent you know still stacks up so uh there are things you know that that uh, uh mfa won't so we have to employ you know that zero trust uh methodology and 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 you know uh provide you know multiple layers then of um protection Right, so it's not just MFA. It's but we, you know, but that's going to that's that's going to uh, prevent the lion's share. Now, when we think about, you know, what are the different methods here? Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, the the bad ones here are are, are passwords, right? Uh, and you know, I'm I'm sure there's uh, a lot of people out there, a lot of accounts out there uh, that still have some very simple, uh, you know, very simple passwords. Um, you know, and it, it, they are it, with with the computing speeds and things now. Uh, it, it's incredibly easy uh, to you know iterate through. Uh, now, of course, you may have um, uh, protections against that, but you know there are a number of different ways that uh, you know maybe a uh, you know uh, some some compromise may uh, you know, dump out a uh, a list of hashes or or password databases. So when you've got physical access to that, you know account lockout features and such don't work. So those things can be uh, can be defeated. You also <laughs> that's uh, I used to have that password or Um but uh, actually I'll tell you what uh, back in 19 let's see what was it uh, 1996 1997 uh, my my password was Microsoft and I didn't work for Microsoft back then. Uh, it, it was it was quite literally T Gwen, and my password was Microsoft, all lowercase, and that was my password for for years until I w realized you know how stupid that was. So, <laughs> uh, um, anyway, uh, <laughs> so yeah, and and the other thing is password spray attacks. Right. So even with our 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 pos you know, even with the technology of of uh, uh, you know attack detection where you know account lockouts after you know four bad password things, you don't have to necessarily know <laughs> the password of uh, all the accounts. You just have to know a lot of common passwords, and essentially you can go uh, you know hit instead of hitting one account with a million different passwords, hit a million accounts with one password. Uh, you know the, the likelihood of, of one of those one million accounts having one of these common passwords 
probably you know it's pretty high unfortunately and if you don't have a second uh second factor in there uh you're you're going to get a uh, you know account compromise <clears throat> now kind of on the on our list here you know password bad that's very bad so good is password plus sms and and, and voice uh but you know there's that can be you know that can be inter, uh, intercepted right so that can be hijacked uh there was a uh there was a us carrier uh, a few years ago that <clears throat> you could walk into one of their retail stores and uh essentially change uh, uh change your number uh without really having to authenticate who you were uh, you know, you, you could, uh, uh, and what would happen is somebody would go in and, and, and change their number or say port, you know, port their number, uh, over and they could, they, they could essentially hijack somebody else's SMS, uh, phone number and, and get, and receive their, uh, you know, receive their, their, uh, multi-factor authentication, either whether it was through text or even voice, right? Now, would that last long? No, but it doesn't have to, right? So now password better, uh, you know, even even better is things like, you know, your push notification, uh, software tokens uh, or one time passwords or hardware tokens with one time passwords. Uh, but best is something, you know, Windows Hello, right? Uh, Windows Hello, FIDO2 or Microsoft Authenticator. So these are, uh, you know, much better and those, I don't know why they, they probably shouldn't say preview anymore because uh, neither of them are, are, are in preview. But uh, you know, those are are, are going to be your your best options uh, for for authentication. And if we take a look at the uh, the management console here, uh, you know, we have a number of different uh, authentication methods. Uh, so you can set up in in our authenticated methods policies here. We can we can set up you know FIDO2 security key, authenticator, SMS, temporary access pass, third party OAuth tokens, voice call, email OTP, or certificate uh, certificate based authentication. So pop over to our uh, portal here. So let's take a look at our authentication methods. So we're in the Microsoft uh, Entra uh, Admin Center. Uh, so if you haven't uh, haven't uh, used this yet, entra.microsoft.com. And let me. Some of you may be viewing on smaller screens, so uh, let me know if that uh, needs to be zoomed in further. Uh, so under authentic, so in the end, uh, uh, Entra Admin Center here, <clears throat> uh, you can go under Protect and Secure, and you'll see authentication methods. So we can see that uh, you know we have a number of different methods here, uh, the same ones uh, on the uh, uh, screenshot we had just a moment ago, uh, and you can go in and uh, uh, configure the policies uh, around these different authentication methods. So if I want to go in and, and enable 502 security, C, uh, uh, security keys, uh, we can enable this. Thanks, Angelica. Uh, so we can enable and target this. Uh, all users uh, and then go into configure, uh, allow self-service setup, uh, enforce at the station, uh, key restrictions if you want to do key restrictions, uh, but you have to provide uh, your, your AA GUIDs uh, to do that. Uh, you can also restrict specific uh, keys, et cetera. So, and if you're going to enforce key restrictions, what you're going to do is you're going to get a, uh, an AA GUID from your, from your provider uh, to, to add in there uh, and, and do that. Okay, so same thing with uh, you know Microsoft Authenticator. You know, so you can enable it, uh, and then this is enabling the policy. So make, make sure I'm, I'm clear on that. This is a, uh, you know uh, uh, in, uh, the, the policy around can, uh, Authenticator. So I could go in and say you know uh, allow use of Microsoft Authenticator uh, one-time password. So if <clears throat> if you if you want to. Uh, you know, if you've used Authenticator and, and you've used it with an Azure AD account, you'll notice that it's in there and it just shows um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the account name and you'll, you won't see, uh, you know, you won't really see anything else. Let's see if I can show you here. Bring my screen share on that, on that over. Is it turned off? Well, I thought I had it on. 
All right, so I'll show you that in a minute. I'll get that. Back, I'll get that back up. But um, you know, you'll see that you you don't you know you'll you'll only see the. Uh, uh, there it goes. So you'll only see the, the the account name. But one of the things that you can do is you can turn on uh, the allow the use of of one time passwords, and I'll pull this up. I'll show you on this one. So I can see my uh, uh, Azure AD account here uh, for Megan Bowen, and I, all I see is is the account name. Now, if I were to turn on, and it won't show unfortunately because it'll take it takes a little bit to uh, uh, to cycle. But if I if I go in and allow the use of OTP, what you'll get is underneath this you'll see a a six digit uh, number, and that number will change every sixty seconds, right? So you can you can provide one time password there uh, as well if 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 you want. So you can also do you know require number matching for push notifications. Uh, so what this does is it uh, uh, um, if you set this up to enabled and I require number matching, uh, what it's going to do is when you're presented with a prompt to authenticate, uh, you know the, say the website will say okay you know pick this, you know, give you a two digit number and you will have to either uh, uh, pick from one of three numbers on your authenticator uh, to match the number or you'll have to enter that two digit number. So there's different, you know, there's a different level of security uh, there. So you can either have it if you if you come in and you say require number matching for push notifications to disabled. What happens is you just get a, a toast notification uh, and you can hit, you know, approve or deny. Uh, if you enable, uh, if you enable it, uh, you're going to have to do the uh, number matching. Okay. Uh, the next one is show the application name uh, in push and password uh, passwordless notifications. I highly recommend this because uh, even on my, you know, uh, even on my Microsoft account uh, and, and, and my, my my personal account, you know, occasionally I'll get an MFA prompt. I'm like, I don't know where this is i'm you know I'm, I'm not doing anything i'm you know uh you know outside you know mowing the grass or something and and i you know i get a buzz on my phone that uh, for for a, a an mfa prompt and i don't rec you know i don't recognize the i don't recognize the application i'm not doing anything with that so i know that i should deny you know that uh uh, uh a request or you know obviously i don't know the two digit number that's being presented to are most likely bad actor. Same thing with geographic location. So we can now with, uh, in, in conjunction with conditional access, uh, we can uh, take the geographic location of the device running authenticator, right? So that gives us GPS location uh, of the authenticator device and enforce uh, you know, policies on that. And what that does is, uh, so we can say, uh, we can also show that geographic location. So if I put, pull up my phone and I get a prompt for, for MFA, it will show, you know, not only, you know, the, 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 uh, the name of the application, it will also show me a little bitty map, uh, you know, and, and where the authentication uh, request is coming from, right? So now you can, you can set these to enabled and disabled on your own, or you can set these to Microsoft Manage. And what this does is it, it, it allows Microsoft to manage whether this feature is enabled uh, or disabled, right? Uh, so, you could do, so you can have it uh, uh, that way as well. So, you know, you, you can do this uh, again, you know, and you have different policies for, you know, for, for, for each one of those. And we're, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to go all uh, through, through each and every single one, but, uh, you know, you, you can go th through and see the, you know, the ones that you want to see uh, and, you know, the, uh, whether, whether you're enabling these, uh, there's not much around SMS settings. Uh, some of them we're going to have configuration settings, and some of the uh, some of them will not. Uh, but you know, all of these methods are available to you, uh, and you can configure and enable those as, uh, as you see fit. Okay, so you also have uh, uh, you know password protection. So this is your uh, account lockout, right? So lockout threshold: how many times, you know, how many bad passwords, uh, bad, bad, bad password attempts, uh, you know, are are going to be allowed before the account gets lockout, right? Uh, and then lockout duration. How long is that? How long is the duration? Uh, you can also do a custom banned password list. Okay, um, so you can uh, enforce our custom list. And if you want to put in, you know, our our, our list of uh, you know bad passwords, 
right? You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. Uh, or you can go through and, and, and do something like, um, you know, look up the, I think they publish like the most com 100 or mo most common uh, passwords uh, list every year. So you can put that in there uh, if you like. Uh, we also do password protection for Windows Server Active Directory. So we can turn that on. Uh, and you can leave this in audit mode or you can put it as enforced. OK, uh, so we can either audit whether, you know, it'll show up in the audit log uh, when when uh, a policy match is here uh, or we can enforce it so that, you know, this is actually what's going to uh, what's going to be happening. Uh, there's a new uh, there's something new. That's coming uh, th that's in preview now called authentication strengths. So there's multi-factor authentication, passwordless multi-factor and phishing resistant uh, MFA. And we'll see this at a moment in conditional access where, um, let's see, there's a question. Oh, did you? Okay, you answered it, Angelica. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is a new thing called, called authentication strength. So you can now create uh, conditional access policies that require multi-factor authentication. And if we look at multi-factor authentication, this is going to include essentially everything, right? It can be Windows Hello, it could be FIDO, it could be temporary access passes, it could be, you know, uh, password plus SMS, password plus voice, federated, uh, et cetera. Essentially any type of multi-factor authentication uh, uh, are, are, are all the different uh, uh, combinations uh, are listed in the, in the base one here. Now we can say passwordless MFA. And that's going to be either Windows Hello for Business, FIDO2, a certificate-based, uh, or Microsoft Authenticator phone sign-in, okay? Or you can say phishing-resistant MFA. Now, phishing-resistant MFA is going to be just Windows Hello, FIDO2, or cert-based, okay? Interesting. Hello, security, uh, FIDO2, or certificate-based authentication. So you can set these uh, uh, different levels and you can also create your, your own authentication strength uh, if you want. Uh, so, you know, you could create one that say, that's just say, you know, Windows Hello uh, for business, right? So, uh, but you can do, you can set these strengths. So now what happens is we can go into conditional access. And if I want to, uh, I, I create a new policy here. And I'm going to call it, uh, I'll just call this uh, um, MFA strength. Uh, so what happens is, so I can go through, I, I can assign this to, I'll assign it to, I'll assign it to um, users and groups, and I'll pick, um, always pick on sales. Uh, do our, you know, all cloud apps, et cetera. Now we go over here to grant and you'll notice we have require multi-factor authentication. Well, this is kind of the, the, the one we've had there for, for, for all times, right? But now you'll see require authentication strength. Uh, and then once you click on that, uh, you'll get the drop down, and you can choose multi-factor authentication, passwordless or phishing resistant MFA. So what, what, what this a policy essentially would do uh, would say that, you know, our sales and marketing users accessing anything have to use phishing resistant MFA, right? Now, is that, you know, and you can, you know, you can uh, uh, decide how you want uh, that, uh, you know, yourself. But, you know, if, if that's what you want on, on this, we can set this to report only if we want to see how it affects people or we can turn it on. Right. And then all users. And if they're not already registered for uh, multi-factor authentication, it's going uh, the next time they, they, they go to authenticate, it's going to prompt them, say, hey, you have to register uh, and then uh, uh, you know, they have to register and then they'll have to use that for it. Um, I don't think there is. I don't know. I don't know. The, I don't know if there's a date. Uh, it does say if we go over, I'll, I'll answer uh, Adam's question here real quick. So it's uh, if you if you look in identity protection, uh, you'll notice on our, our user risk policy, it says we recommend migrating user risk policy to conditional access. So it doesn't give us a date yet, uh, but it is encouraging us to to to, to make that migration. So let's see. I just want to make sure I, I stay in my um, 
stay on 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 task here. So uh, again, you know, this one's just going to talk about SSO, but uh, so so that single sign-on gives you that capability, uh, you know, to come, you know, to to come into say something like Workday in your HR app, provision your users, uh, and immediately give them, uh, you know, create their accounts. And then provision them not only in all of your 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 Microsoft type applications, but any uh, any third party SaaS apps uh, that that you may have, right? So they would instantly have access to whether it's you know uh, you know you know works with pretty much everybody, even you know even even competitors, you know like like Slack or. Uh, um, uh, Workplace, etc., uh, but all of these different things uh, can be uh, can be immediately accessed by your users. And the the cool thing is, once they're once they're done, they can go to my apps <clears throat> that Microsoft.com, log in, and they will see uh, their my apps portal. So it works on mobile, works you know obviously in the uh, uh, browser, uh, and then you'll you'll get a you know you get this uh, cool portal. Uh, for uh, that's going to give them links into uh, into all their applications. Now, you know, these are obviously going to be your your web versions of applications. You can still uh, you know push out uh, you know your your locally installed uh, applications, uh, etc. So uh, there's a cool question that uh, that uh, uh, somebody asked here, and I'll go back over and I'll show you something interesting if you if you haven't seen this. Uh, when you go into conditional access and you go to a policy, uh, you can you can click over here to the what if, and you can essentially choose a policy here and and see or, or I'm sorry put in a set of conditions, and it'll show you what policies apply, right? So if I go and, and say service principle, I can say a user, uh, and I can do user or workload identity. Right. So if I choose you know, something like user uh, and then I can uh, select a user and we'll select, uh, let's see, select my, my favorite person to pick on, Lydia. Uh, any cloud app, you know, it uh, depends on, you know, you can do any uh, or you can do select, you know, select an application. Uh, we'll do any for the moment. You can put in an IP address. Right. So, um, you know, I'll put in. I'll put in some random IP address, like the one that was there, right? Um, select a country. Uh, so you know, maybe you've got something uh, that uh, uh, that restricts, you know, where where something's coming from. So I'm just going to pick Yemen. Uh, what device platform are they coming from? Windows Phone still in there? Love that. I miss my Windows Phone. Uh, say iOS. What app are you know? What client app are they using? Are they using a browser? Are they using a mobile app? Uh, mobile app and desktop clients with modern auth, right? So we'll see that. Uh, select a device state. Now, device state is deprecated, so we're not going to look at that. Uh, but sign in risk. So I can say sign in risk is you know at or below uh, you know low. User risk, same thing. Low. I'm not going to do a, a SP risk. And then you also have custom properties. Then you click on what if. And of course, my. Uh, um, Nothing, nothing matches, right? But you'll also see policies that don't apply, right? So all these pol all of these policies do not apply. Uh, so if I go through and, and and you know I can reset this, and I can say instead of uh, Lydia, maybe I can just say a guest user, right? And I'll say uh, I just say let's see other external users, okay? And then. I have a tenant ID. Why is that changing that? All right, we'll say that, right? So it's a, a an external user that has an Outlook.com uh, ID, right? Any cloud, at, uh, you know, any cloud or app access, uh, we'll say it's. I know I have one set up for, uh, you know, set up for Teams. So we'll turn on Teams, and I'll stay simple on the rest of them, right? So I'm gonna delete the rest. I'm just gonna say, um, just come back up here to our our default. Uh, it's a mobile app. Device date, sign in risk low, what if? Right, I see policies that apply. 
Uh, let's see, do I not have it enabled? All right, so I should have a Teams one show up, and that this is the this is the interesting part, right? So I know I have a Teams po a, te a guest access to Teams policy, but why is my policy not applying, right? So I have Teams guest users reasons why this policy will not apply. Not enough information. Hmm, okay, so I can go back into my policy and see what it is that needs to be or what it is that, that that's being uh, done, and I can just say, you know, I find out, okay, guest or external users. Uh, you know, all of them are selected, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, specify external organizations, all uh, cloud apps or actions. My one app is Teams for conditions. I have a user risk is low, sign in risk. So I cleared out a couple of these, right? So I don't have, uh, I don't have a couple of those uh, configured in my what if. So now I can kind of see why it's not getting, you know, why it's not being applied. So you know that's that's a, a a neat tool to you know to figure out what's going on and and uh, you know why uh, why a policy is or is not being applied uh, under certain conditions. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Let me show you. All right. So I, I kinda, you kind of saw it in the in the in the screenshot, but you know once you you know you onboard your 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 users, so you know you get your apps dashboard. Uh, so from here, you you know go in and, and uh, you know launch whatever or whatever applications that that you pushed out to your users. Uh, you know the web versions of these. You can search apps. You can add apps. Uh, you can either add a site. You can request new apps, uh, etc. Uh, and then access pretty much all of your stuff. You can go over from my apps. You can click over here to my account. And you'll see all the relevant information about your account. You can change things, uh, like if you want to uh, put in a, you know, an alternate name or or, or clarifying title, etc. You'll see all your devices, uh, your organizations, sign-ins, uh, etc. So it's a nice, easy way to get to some of that. Uh, you also hit, uh, I think, uh, I think Angelica is going to talk about it a little bit later, but you can hit my access. Uh, which will show you uh, access packages uh, along the, you know, from like uh, identity governance. So this is where you can do that uh, and request, you know, uh, access out, out into, uh, uh, you know, very uh, uh, like a project or or something else. So uh, you also see my groups, so you get to see what groups you're a member of, right? So this makes it a lot uh, a, a lot easier. Uh, also shows uh, groups that you own. Right, so I have Project Oak Tree, which is uh, a, a team that I created. Right, so uh, some really cool stuff there. All right, so I think I covered all of that. All right, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about hybrid identity uh, for for a moment. <laughs> so you know you, you can only secure you know what you know and what you have visibility into. Um, and by, by providing you know this this uh, uh, you know, single identity system uh, for for both cloud and on-prem and and uh, uh, SaaS apps etc uh, allows you to close a lot of, of very critical security gaps. You know, uh, gone are the days of of uh, you know people having to uh, you know keep a, a a sticky note under their keyboard with you know their username and password for all the different systems. Uh, that they have to uh, uh, log into, uh, and then you know if they if they move or you know leave the company, uh, you know IT has to go through and, and audit and make sure you know they they remove access remove their account and access uh, on every system you know that had a separate identity. So being able to provide this makes make you know not not only makes it easier, it makes it a lot more secure uh, for for one of those things uh, for when those things go wrong. Uh, and then you can set you know things like uh, conditional access even for you know external third party SaaS apps because uh, you're using that one identity. So uh, even though they're ac accessing an external system, they still have to authenticate uh, you know back to your Active Directory uh, environment. So you can control. Uh, you know, you, you can set up different requirements there as well. So, <clears throat> you know, being able to, to do that and and just being able to, uh, you know, connect pretty much any 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 app in any cloud uh, or data center across, you know, your hybrid environment, uh, you know, from that from that single portal, uh, just, just uh, reduces the overhead uh, on your IT department tremendously. Uh, and I know that you know we're we're all being asked to uh, uh, kind of do more with less, um, which is uh, nothing really all that new. Uh, but uh, you know, 
reducing, you know, uh, just administrative overhead, you know, makes it a lot easier on your IT staff, right? And uh, when they're not stressed and 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 worrying about, uh, you know, running running to and fro, they're going to be, you know, they can. Uh, also co concentrate a little bit more on, on being secure and they're not gonna be looking for shortcuts uh, to be able to do things faster. Uh, and then, you know, another big thing is external identities, uh, being able to manage, uh, you know, access to, uh, uh, you know, vendors or, or partners, um, uh, contractors, et cetera, uh, that may be coming in and out, uh, being able to uh, do that without actually creating real accounts in your environment, uh, just being able to, uh, you know, leverage their 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 existing identity in in uh, you know in their in their environment, uh, and then just managing the access that that identity has into yours. So, you know, uh, the hybrid identity you know kind of uh, first came from you know the idea to, uh, oh sorry the ID I, ugh, idea. Uh, you know, of synchronizing, synchronizing your, your on-prem uh, users, uh, you know, but then, you know, it kind of expands out uh, to, um, you know, your externals. So, and then, you know, uh, being able to take those external identities and run those through, you know, your policy engine to enforce, you know, your security, your customization, uh, and then provide access out uh, to those. So, <clears throat> you, you can, you can really be, you're really able to, to scale your apps uh, you know, to your consumers, your customers, uh, you know, citizens for 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 government uh, using you know Azure uh, Azure AD B to C or B to B. You know, you, you can create customer facing apps. Uh, you know, you can use uh, you know and use Azure AD as your directory uh, for your consumers, right? And then the same billing model you know now applies to external identity capabilities. So it's all uh, based on oops. Uh, it's all based on um, where was I? Oh, the billing model. Uh, so pricing is all based on your your monthly active users, which is kind of a, a count of your unique users, uh, you know, with, with authentication activity within a, a particular calendar month, right? So, uh, you know, and then managing access for those, you know, separately across all the different uh, directories, you know, that that leaves some pretty critical uh, gaps there in security. So being able to do it all from Azure AD. Uh, you know, it makes it a lot easier, a lot more secure uh, uh, for for both you and your uh, and and your clients, right? So you can easily, uh, you know, invite you know partners to collaborate, uh, automate how you manage their access. You can do uh, Angelica will talk later about uh, access reviews, uh, so that you know once you grant somebody access, you know you're going to uh, perform uh, you know periodic reviews to see if they still need access. Right, because uh, that's all. That's also a a point of identity governance that needs to be addressed. Right. So the next section here, I, I've already kind of talked about. Uh, already kind of went into uh, conditional access and identity protection. Uh, one thing I haven't really shown you yet is identity secure score. So <clears throat> you're probably familiar with uh, some of the other uh, score dashboards that we have. Uh, so you'll see you know, secure score uh, in the uh, in the Defender portal. Uh, you'll see uh, like compliance score. Uh, you'll see a score in uh, in Defender for Cloud, et cetera. Well, we also have an identity secure score, um, and it's 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 this. Don't don't get me wrong. It's the same type of information that you're going to see in in like normal secure score. It's just uh, uh, filtered down or scoped down to to show uh, identity specific settings. Uh, so let's see. Let me show you that. So. It, it is also under the protect and secure uh, section here of Entra. I'm sorry, uh, where'd it go? It's only drawn a blank. Why is it not showing? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let's see, uh, go down here to is there it is I already added in the form. oh so now it shows up <laughs> okay so it should show up under here uh this one was kind of throwing me off so 
uh, should show up under per, uh, protect and secure. Maybe I just needed to refresh or something. But uh, so what you'll get is a secure score for identity. Uh, right now I've got a 56.58%. Uh, uh, you can also, you know, and, and like I said, this is essentially just a scoped view uh, of, of the overall Microsoft secure score. OK, so but it will give you a comparison. So, you know, I'm a 56.58. Uh, I have my you know, um, uh, organization set to a one to 100 person company. Uh, so in comparison to your typical one to 100 person company, uh, you know, I'm just slightly below uh, average. Right. You'll also see, uh, you know, your your score history here, how your score has changed uh, over time. Uh, and. And then, of course, you get your, your normal uh, secure score type uh, improvement actions. So now all of these, again, are scoped to uh, address identity uh, uh, security uh, points, right? So things like setting a honey token account, use least privileged administrative roles, protect all users with a user risk policy. So and you'll see what the score impact is uh, and you can sort this. So if you want to make a big impact here, you know, 8%. Uh, would be to require multi-factor authentication for uh, all administrative roles. Okay. Um, and then, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, multi-factor authentication uh, registration. So ensure all users can complete uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, you know, enable policy to block legacy authentication. So a lot of different things that that here that, you know, you can you know, kind of look and see what your impact is going to be, uh, you know, on your score. So, you know, top three here we're looking uh at you know 15 uh you know 21 uh so i could get this up to you know what, 70 77 percent uh just by doing these top three right so pretty uh pretty significant uh impact there okay so what i'm going to do is go back over here to uh, uh to get additional access and point out a couple of other things here so one you can do uh named locations uh so i, I mentioned you know you can use the uh, gps location uh of um uh the authenticator uh to uh, uh to scope things down so you can go through and, and create a you know uh, country's location ip location uh etc as as a named uh, as a named location um so I can do for one, you know, for for United States. If I wanted to do one for, um, I can do this by GPS coordinates, right? So I can name this location as, uh, you know, uh, we'll call this uh, um, um, EU, right? Uh, and then I could go through and and set uh, the countries uh, that. Uh, um, you know that, that are involved that, that I want done and it's not going to and the difference here is it's not going to uh, determine the location by the IP address because IP address could be spoofed it's going to determine it by the GPS coordinates of the device running authenticator uh, and, and the, the using this name location does require uh, using authenticator uh, as the as the authentication method right so if I wanted to set this so that they were you know they had to be you know say in, in uh, oh no you um, it'll say what uh, um, I'll show my ignorance here where is if I can find F uh, so we'll, we'll just pick France for now uh, so uh, we'll put uh, see Germany's right there so we'll just pick France and Germany for for the moment right so I'll create one <clears throat> so now I can I can go into my policies then. And if I want to, uh, um, you know, select this down, I'll select this down, of course, to my users uh, for, I'll just pick a random group here. Not that one. Executives, <laughs> we'll do this to the executives. Uh, you know, and I could do cloud apps uh, and whether I want to do all uh, or select, um, so we'll select, uh, we'll select office. Just for fun. Okay, so I can go in here and 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 set this under location. You know, for conditions, I can set locations here now, uh, and and set either any location, all trusted locations, or selected locations. Right. So I can set EU. Right. So I can select EU here as my location, and then I can grant them access, uh, but require. Uh, you know, maybe I can require, I'll, I'll require phishing resistance MFA, 
right? So essentially, if they're if they're in the EU, they have to provide fishing resistant MFA, right? Um, and then you could do multiple, you know, you could do multiple conditions. Maybe it's got to be mark compliant. Uh, it's got to be a um, Maybe they have to, and that's not a guest in terms of use. So we'll just do that, right? So the device is compliant and they have to do uh, phishing resistant. Um, so, and we can create that policy. And I'll just leave it as report only uh, for the moment, but uh, oops. Our EU execs, right? So we create that policy now, and in anybody that's in the executive, uh, you know, that's an executive in the EU, uh, for the moment, you know, I've only got it on, on report only. Uh, so I would see that in the in the audit logs. Uh, but I, you know, once I determine that everything is working the way uh, it should, I can come back in and change that to on, and then it'll start enforcing that policy, right? Uh, and then of course we could use the what if policy here. Um, Let's see, I, uh, well, let's not do that because I don't know off the top of my head who's in that uh, particular group. Uh, but anyway, you could, you could do the what if policy, select a user, you know, select one of your executive users uh, and, and see if this is going to apply or not, okay? All right, so let's see. All right, so I wanna point out, let's see, let's go over here to identity protection. Doing it for time. Okay, good. Um, Maybe done a little bit earlier. So, all right. So, and identity protection. <clears throat> so, you'll. This is actually a pretty easy uh, section to, so, to to set up. Uh, but you're making a couple of changes here to it. So, uh, in the past, it's essentially been uh, these three protect policies. So, a user risk policy, a sign-in risk policy, and a multi-factor authentication registration policy. Uh, but there's. Uh, but we're recommending now. We're gonna we're gonna have you uh, migrate these instead of having these policies uh, in here. We're gonna migrate these over to the conditional access um, portal uh, and have you do them there. Okay, because that's all these were to begin with. They were just conditional. They were they were just conditional access policies anyway. Uh, and user risk policies, you know, you could essentially do either all users or select individual users or groups. Uh, select a user risk level, right? So the likelihood that the user account is compromised, right? So you medium and above, um, and then decide what you want to do, right? So essentially, if it's medium or high user risk, we're going to block access. Okay. Now you could say if it's medium or above, you could still allow access, but require a password change, right? You could do either one. It's very simple, but that's it. That's all the controls you had. Uh, right, exactly. So, so Adam pointed out that that you know by moving this over to uh, the to conditional access, you get a lot more granular uh, capabilities. So if I wanted to say say this is user risk medium and above, so instead of setting it here. I can go over to conditional access and I can create uh, a say our, our my user risk policy on this side, and I'm going to say all users. So I want I'm going to have this apply to all users. Um, you know, don't lock yourself out, right? So all users, all cloud apps, right? And the condition is going to be uh, user risk, right? So I'm going to configure this and. Uh, I'm going to say you know, medium or high, okay? And then I'm going to, uh, so I'm just doing user risk, and then I can go over here to grant, and I can say block access, right? So that's it. Uh, or I can say grant access, you know, if they're high risk, I could say grant access, but I'm going to require, you know, phishing resistant MFA. I'm also going to require password change, right? Um, all cloud, yeah, it can only be used all cloud. Yeah, I got it. So, you know, I could, uh, so this, you know, so I can set a lot more uh, granularity here, uh, right? And I could create more than just this one, right? So I could create user risk, you know, admins, right? And put it one way. And I could do another one and have it say, uh, you know, user risk for, you know, sales, which you couldn't really do. Um, in uh, um, which you couldn't really do in, in, in identity protection. So uh, licenses, it's all Ag, uh, Azure AD P2. So, um, 
yeah. So anyway, um, so you know, you could do this differently, you know, by saying, you know, I could come in here and say sales, and then have my, uh, you know, have users uh, be, you know, just say, you know, be my my, my sales and, um, you know, marketing group, right? Or I could have, uh, you know, I've got my, uh, um, so I say it, my sales and marketing group, right? So I could do it that way. Uh, or, you know, if it's admins, I could do it that way. So you get a lot more granularity there. Uh, same thing with, um, I'm just going to leave this, let's see, turn this back to all users. Choose that. So I'm going to go ahead and create this policy, but I'm going to leave it, uh, I'm going to leave it on, uh, I'm going to say block access, but report only. Very important, report only. Right. Oh, I forgot to click OK. Block access, select. And I'll exclude my, so it's a really uh, neat feature, right? So don't lock yourself out. Uh, so it will automatically, ex it, it'll allow you to automatically exclude the current user. So this is this is the users being used, right? So I can exclude my current user or say, nope, I understand my account will be impacted, proceed anyway. Uh, so for the moment, I'll do that. But it's in report only, uh, right? And then you also have, um, you know, so the other thing in, in here is sign-in risk policy. Right, so you'll also see if I come into sign in risk, we, you know, we recommend migrating sign in risk policy over to CA as well. So there's so the same, pretty much the same, uh, you know, uh, same procedure, right? So I'm going to say sign in risk, all users, uh, all apps, conditions. So instead of user risk, I'm going to say sign in risk. Yes, if it's if sign in risk is medium or high. Again, I go over here. Now I can either block access or I can grant access, but you know, again, I'm gonna say phishing resistant MFA and I'm gonna require password change just because, right? So same thing. Uh oh, require oh sorry, that's a uh, user risk, so I can't do that. Uh, uh no, 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 don't want that. I'll just take I'll just take that off. Uh, anyway, so uh, under grant uh, password uh, password change was uh, user risk only. So anyway, we still grant access but require phishing resistant uh, MFA, right? So all users, all cloud apps, uh, that's our our, our sign-in risk policy, and do that. And I'll just leave this at report only for now. But this essentially replaces then uh, the ones that are in identity protection, okay? And it just gives you a a, a more granular control. Uh, it depends on what your depends on what features you're using. Uh, many of the uh, uh, there are you do have conditional access in uh, in P1, uh, but you don't have the um, Angelica. Help me out here if you remember what the, the difference is. You don't have the uh, risk based. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, you don't have ri the risk based stuff uh, in P1. Uh, so it, it's kind of the, the, my rule of thumb on, on pretty much all of our P1 versus P2 license offerings, uh, P1, all the stuff is there, but it's manual, uh, P2 it's automatic, right? You get more, you get more auto, auto, automatic type features, uh, uh, in it. So, um, anyway, and the next thing here in. Uh, in identity protection is your multi-factor authentication registration policy. This is the easy button for MFA uh, to get everyone in your environment at least registered. This does not enforce MFA anywhere. It just makes, it just enforces registration, right? So that they're, they get either their phone number uh, or their authenticator app or their FIDO2 key, et cetera, information registered with the system. So that if they encounter a multi-factor authentication prompt, uh, they uh, uh, they're ready to uh, they're ready to, to authenticate, right? So all all you have to do is you know all users require it and enforce, right? And done. So all right. Anyway, uh, and now once you get the you know once you get these uh, uh, configured now. Even if you, you know, configure these in conditional access, that's fine, uh, or that, that's preferred now, right? But uh, essentially what you're going to get is you're going to get uh, in the reporting, you're going to see your risky users. 
Okay, so I've got you know a couple of risky users here. Uh, you can you can see uh, uh, if I if I click on them, uh, it'll tell you know what my uh, basic info is. It'll say uh, you know what my uh, recent risky sign-ins were. Uh, no recent ones uh, for this one. It's it's just an old one. Uh, Detection is not linked, or I can see my risk history. Uh, essentially, uh, you know it's been a while, uh, but I, I logged in from an anonymous IP address, right? Uh, and this could be anything from, uh, you know, maybe you couldn't, I, maybe we could not determine it. Maybe it was a, a Tor, uh, maybe I logged in through a Tor browser uh, or used a proxy server uh, to do it. So you can see, you know, kind of what, uh, what, what's going on. Uh, and like this one shows last month. Um, I don't know how far, I think this link goes back like 90 days. Nope, 30 days. All right, so I only see I haven't done it in I haven't done it in 30 days, right? So it has to be the last 30 days to see uh, in the reporting. But uh, hmm. <laughs> yay! I made it mad. Sorry about that. All right, so. Back into the risky users, and so but we can see, you know, what what some of these things were, uh, you know, uh, and, but you'll see risk last updated uh, was was uh, you know 421. But you also see uh, risky workload identities, and we see I have one. I'll show you a bigger a bigger tenant with a lot more a lot more uh, stuff in it. So uh, we'll take a look at risky users. So now this one's going to have a lot more information. In it. I just don't have uh, read or write access to this, uh, but you'll see, you know, what the, you know, what the user was, what their risk state is, what their risk level is, risk last updated, uh, and you go in and see, you know, uh, you know what their uh, what their details were, recent risky sign-ins. Come on. Come on, load. There we go. So last, you know, last recent risky signing was Azure Portal 316 from Montclair, New Jersey. Right, risk state was was you know it was at risk, low low, low level conditional access not applied. Right, uh, but you can also see risky sign-ins, uh, which will come up, and you'll see you know more detail as to what uh, you know where that where they were, etc. And you see for the for the last month or so. All right, that's just going to show you pretty much the same thing. Uh, what I want to show you here is risky sign-ins. To me, this is a little bit better view. So you'll see that you know all the different all the different risky sign-ins that have, have have occurred, and you'll see the IP address uh, and what the location was, right? So you see we've got you know logins coming from all over the place, right? Um, and then you'll see whether it's at risk, uh, and then you can dig down into them, uh, you know, if you want to see, you know, the, the the differences. Okay, and then you can see risk detections, which will show you the detection type, such as impossible travel, anonymous IP, uh, botnet. Um, I don't think what the uh, some of the other ones were. Um, see what the uh, see what it comes up. So uh, unfamiliar sign-in properties. Uh, anomalous token, atypical travel, uh, right? So atypical travel is just you know, uh, um, you know where why is it uh, you know they last logged in in let's see um, six, right they last logged in, in in Dublin now they're logging in you know East Sussex now they're logging in in India right because it's all the same uh, it's a shared uh, you know sh uh, shared uh, user account there for partner demo. Um, but you can see that you know all the different places that people are logging in, some of the different detection types uh, that get uh, uh, that, that get detected, right? So I want to see if there's any of the uh, any of the cooler ones here. Oh, activity from anonymous IP address, right? So suspicious inbox manipulation rules, right? So now now we're looking at uh, uh, some stuff that well that's weird. There you know somebody's logged in and 
and they made an inbox manipulation inbox manipulation rule. So they created uh, maybe a forwarding rule or something. So now, you know, this is something you might want to dig into and even go into, uh, you know, Sentinel or Defender <coughs> and investigate, right? So you can see some really interesting uh, things in here, right? Okay. All right. Let's see. I think I, I want to. I think I covered most of the stuff in in the uh, in the portal, right? But just just so that you see, right? It's you know uh, uh, with CA we're taking in all the different signals. There's you know terabytes and terabytes of of uh, uh, threat signals that we're bringing in. But I don't want that to change. Okay. Um, bring in you know a lot of different signals. Uh, looking at the user, their location, what application they're using, what the real time risk is, what device they're on, and then verifying every access attempt. And it's also continuous access evaluation, right? So um, it's not just a one and done, right? We're, we're continually looking at that real time, even after they've authenticated, even after they've provided MFA, we're continually evaluating real time risk. And if that risk factor changes during their session, they may get a second prompt, right? So because something has something because something has changed. Okay, uh, let's see. Already covered pretty much all of our identity protection. Um, right. So, you know, real time, you know, real time uh, uh, continuous detection. Uh, we're looking at security alerts, you know, the entire time, right? For for all uh, for for all the organization's identities, uh, and then you know you can you can receive you know various alerts if if a user's risk you know gets gets to a, a specific threshold. Uh, you know, you can set you know set our policies, conditional access to block sign-ins, uh, and then you know with that P2, you've got connected intelligence. Right, so you've got all the uh, all of the uh, uh, um, uh, risk-based conditional access uh, capabilities there, and you know you've got the you've got that view, right? So we saw that suspicious incident, we saw that you know uh, suspicious inbox uh, rule manipulation. So that's something that's probably going to correlate with an alert in Sentinel or Defender, um, and we'd be able to go and investigate that, right? Um, and just overall. Uh, you know, it's proactive, uh, and, and we're doing this all the time. So I think I've covered. I think we talked about all of this already in the uh, uh, through through the demo. But uh, you know, we're looking. Some of the things we're looking for, though, for 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 like risk events and risky accounts. Uh, there, there's six types uh, of risk events. Uh, that we're that we're using for for like machine uh, machine learning and heuristic rules. Uh, users with leaked credentials. Uh, uh, Sign-ins from anonymous IP addresses, impossible travel uh, travel to atypical locations. Uh, Sign-ins from infected devices. Uh, Sign-ins from IP addresses with suspicious activity, uh, or just sign-ins from unfamiliar locations. Right. So we're we're employing you know user behavior analytics in there as well. Uh, so we understand that you know this user always logs in from you know uh, uh, say Houston, Texas, and suddenly you know after three years of never logging in from anywhere else, they're logging in from Sheboygan. Uh, uh, so that, that's something that, that might be, uh, uh, might raise a little bit of a red flag or at least a yellow one, right? Uh, so, you know, being able to come back and, and provide, you know, some recommendations there to, to improve our, our posture and, and, uh, you know, maybe upgrade to, you know, conditional access, uh, control. So, uh, kind of the same thing, uh, you know, you can go through and, and look at this stuff through, through the graph API. Uh, uh, you can access it through through logic apps uh, as well and, and respond to uh, different alerts. Um, I kind of talked about this one already, or I listed this one out already, but, you know, leak credentials, anonymous, impossible travel, unfamiliar, suspicious activity, or infected devices. Uh, and then it's not limited to these, right? So we're, you know, we'll, we'll add, you know, new risk alerts, uh, you know, as, as uh, uh, you know, as new things, uh, new things emerge. Right. So uh, just kind of a, a one little note here. This one's going to be a bit. This one's a bit of of, uh, of an eye chart, uh, but this is from the uh, cybersecurity reference architecture. Uh, this is our zero trust user access uh, page, and it, it, it's, it gets kind of busy. But you know, essentially, what we're we're, we're looking for is uh, you know, just kind of uh, um, we want to enable users to be productive uh, and secure. Right, where wherever they are, whatever they're using, um, 
and you know, measuring user risk uh, is, is one way of doing that, right? So we want we want to measure the risk of the account itself. Um, you know, uh, ID protection is, is going to look at the user account, the current access request, uh, you know, and, and give that high, medium, low risk rating. Uh, and then that that rating is determined by by using you know machine learning uh, across. I don't know. It's, I don't know what it's up to. It's. It's. I think it's a little over 250 terabytes of of signals a day, uh, but a lot of different risk factors. Uh, you know, for for like lead credentials, your travel. You know, all those those six different things, uh, and determine what that risk factor is. Yeah, Angelica has got, got those questions answered. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, uh, MFA, of course, required for some reasonable security assurance here. Uh, yeah, because it's awfully easy uh, for attackers to, uh, you know, impersonate an account uh, with adversary in the middle, uh, you know, when, they're, when it's only password protected, right? Again, we go back to that 99.9% uh of uh, uh of identity uh, attacks can be can be uh, thwarted by by just using mfa right <clears throat> the second one here is is device risk so if we look at the if we look at the device risk and we measure uh this by by explicitly verifying whether the the device itself is is compliant with what your organization's policies are and that can be no malicious activity has been detected uh from it uh, if it's got uh, endpoint detection, um, uh, um, defender for endpoint installed, uh, is it so overall? You know, is it compliant? Is it is it jailbroken? Is it rooted? Uh, <clears throat> is it up to date? Does it have all the package uh, uh, patches on it? So you'll get back and is compliant? Yes or no, right? So you can make a, a determination on you know whether it gets in or not based on its compliant uh, uh, compliance stance. You can also set up device attributes so we can we can filter policies so that they require uh, specific device attributes. So uh, maybe to, ident to identify, you know, highly secured, uh, you know, privileged access workstations. Right. So things like that. So uh, we're also evaluating you know, these signals against the policies that you that you have uh, configured. Right. So these, uh, you know, these policies and, and also, you know, some some real time uh, information uh, like threat intelligence, session context, et cetera. Uh, those are going to give you uh, a very adaptive approach to be able to manage that risk um, to uh, uh, um, give you a consistent, informed uh, uh, stance, you know, so because we're we're continuously monitoring, uh, you know, the changes in 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 real world conditions, right? Uh, so you'll get you get uh, you know initial uh, initial access and that token refresh. So you know for for applications using the CA, that policy validation happens at the time of each access request. Uh, also, when the token is refreshed to extend that, that expiration time, so we're looking at that uh, each time, and then we're also looking at you know conti uh, continuous access evaluation, uh, and that gives you a lot faster response uh, to the cha changing risks, right? Uh, now, the, uh, CAE is is not uh, supported in every app, but right now it's 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 uh, supported in uh, you know Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, uh, and and Teams. <laughs> I mean, my voice is getting a little uh, starting to go here. Um, if uh, uh, so, we also do you know uh, remediate, right? So so leak credentials. We're we're constantly looking you know out in the ether, right? Um, uh, you know, out in the ether for for you know credential dumps, right? For for breaches. So if we find uh, a you know if we find a Azure AD account. Uh, uh, account credential, uh, you know, whether it's a, a, you know account ID, password pair, hash, etc. Uh, if we find that out in the wild, we'll test it, and if it's valid, you know, we can mark that account as uh, uh, as compromised, right? So the next time they try to authenticate, it's going to require MFA, and it's also going to require a password reset, right? Because we still have passwords for now, okay? Uh, but we provide that that re that remediation, so you can configure it to be, you know, re uh, re you know, have them redirected immediately over to the to the uh, uh, password reset site to, to change it. And then you know we've got inter, uh, integration with uh, you know uh, Microsoft apps and third-party VPN and devices. <laughs> so, you know, of, of course, our cloud, our cloud apps, you know, natively support uh, Azure AD and, and, and conditional access and third party, you know, like VPN, remote access devices, uh, you know, we can, we can uh, 
um, increase the security for remote access to those apps, right? And, and add some sophisticated user and device risk uh, validation authentication. And that can mitigate a lot of the common, uh, you know, password and device risk. And a lot of the vendors now support uh, Azure AD, like, like AnyConnect, Palo Alto, Global, uh, Captive, uh, you know, F5, Fortinet, uh, uh, Netscaler, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, kind of expand that out and see, you know, see all the, uh, your your entire uh, estate there, and you know also look at legacy applications and ses uh, session monitoring through Azure AD App Proxy, right? And then uh, all of this is integrated with uh, D Defender for Cloud Apps. Uh, you know, conditional access app control uh, enables session monitoring uh, and restrictions, so you can monitor sessions and restrict functionality within session policies based on, on uh, the signals that you're getting out of conditional access or, or other uh, Defender for Cloud App detections, right? So uh, we can look to see, you know, prevent data exfiltration, uh, per, you know, uh, a mass download, upload uh, of unlabeled files, uh, you know, monitor sessions for compliance, block access, or custom activities, okay? All right, 